So I'm sitting in for Sheila Murthy, so I'm not going to do the normal moderator thing of talking about my experiences. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, I hope I'm, nothing got unhooked here. I'm, that's OK, yeah. Um, so we're going to start today with, uh, we have an incredible panel. We're going to start, maybe I'll introduce each person as they speak, with Mark Fleming, who's a partner at Wilmer Hale here in Boston and a uh, incredible appellate and Supreme Court um, litigator. He's, uh, and of course, an alum. Um, and uh, his, one of his most famous cases that he argued successfully before the Supreme Court was Judah Lang versus Holder, which opened up a whole area of relief to a whole large group of immigrants. And uh, he can describe in more detail what that was. Um, so um, let me give it over to Mark. Oh, and I'm sorry. One of the things about Mark is he clerked for both the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court of Canada. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, yeah, it's kind of pathetic. Most people are able to pick a country. Um, I was not. Um, everyone's talked about their immigrant past. My wife and I are both from Canada originally, and uh, so I had to deal with immigration law very personally, and I thought, well, seems to be there's an immigration law class on offer here. Why don't I go and see what I can learn? And it was very useful and, as for many of you, quite life-changing. Life so thank you very much, Debbie, for that very kind introduction, um, and congratulations to you and to everybody who made the clinic such a success for such a, a long time. And it's a tremendous honor for me uh, to be on a panel with Lee and Steve, uh, both of whom were legends when I was at the clinic in 1995. And I never thought that I would get to be their opening act. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to serve that role. Um, looking at the list of today's speakers, um, you know, judges, illustrious immigration practitioners, Professors of immigration law, government officials, the godlike Nancy Kelly and John Wilshire Carrera. I feel a bit the odd man out for a lot of reasons, uh, but primarily because I am not an immigration lawyer. Uh, I am a generalist. I work in what is generally and pejoratively referred to as big law. And uh, so when Debbie first invited me to talk, my first reaction was to invite her to reconsider because I wasn't sure exactly what I could say about immigration law and immigration work that uh, you don't already know or that hasn't been conveyed uh, with greater depth and sophistication than I ever could. So what I opted for was to talk about why, even as a generalist who's part of big law, um, I've nonetheless continued to be involved in immigration cases and maybe to give a sense of how a generalist can sometimes contribute, um, notwithstanding and maybe even sometimes because of the generalist perspective that one has in a firm that does not itself specialize in um, immigration, because I'm guessing that at least some of the young people in the room here might at some point over the course of your careers find yourselves in the same position as me. Um, Debbie's class and the clinic showed me a few things about the immigration law that I didn't really expect to discover when I came here as a recently arrived uh, immigrant from Canada. First of all, that um, US immigration law is a mess. I mean, uh, that was a surprise to me. It's a real, yeah, right. It wasn't quite 30 years ago, Debbie. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, uh, but that's fine. Um, it was long enough ago, I suppose. Um, well, I mean, you know, what a jumble of like, conundrums and nooks and detours and vague propositions and contradictions, which, you know, for someone who likes to solve puzzles is almost sort of irresistibly enticing. Um, second, one of the reasons it's a mess is, as um, I believe Rosemary mentioned uh, on the last panel, it draws from so many different legal disciplines, not all of which necessarily mesh all that harmoniously. You have constitutional law, immigration law, criminal law, civil rights, family law, labor law, international law. Uh, for fans of doctrine, it's quite the smorgasbord. And the third thing, and this is what the clinic really showed me, is that having a lawyer in the immigration world, even if it is a junior, inexperienced generalist who has never stood up in a court before, really can make a difference to the outcome. 
Uh, and so when I entered private practice and there were lots of different pro bono opportunities available to me, I personally gravitated towards immigration cases. Um, as a junior associate, I did two asylum cases with PEAR uh, here in Boston, the Political Asylum Immigration Representation Project. Uh, I had one that went to a full merits hearing. I had never stood up in court before. I'd never examined a witness in court before, but I put on my client, I put on two experts, and at the end of the morning, Judge Shepard granted asylum from the bench. This actually, I mean, what, what surprised me the most about that experience is it really wasn't that hard, right? All it took was, um, you know, dedication, good work, the resources that being in a big firm can give you, and a rudimentary understanding of litigation procedure and substantive immigration law, all things that I learned from Debbie and from the clinic in spades. And applying those skills can make such a difference. I mean, I think I can say without fear of contradiction that immigration judges, the Board of Immigration Appeals, the Courts of Appeals, listen differently and pay greater attention when there is a lawyer there making a polished presentation uh, than they do when, no matter how intelligent and well-spoken a pro se applicant can be, uh, is there without counsel. Um, I'm not saying it should be that way. In fact, I think it's quite unfortunate that it is that way, but that's just the case. And what that means is that by virtue of being a lawyer, even if you've never done this before and you don't feel like you know what you're doing, if the alternative is no lawyer at all, you can make a very big difference. And as I got older, I realized there's another way that a generalist in big law can contribute in this area, and that's by applying the specialized skills that you learn through the practice of law for your paying clients. Um, what do I mean? Well, I joined Wilmer Hale to pursue appellate work, as Debbie said. Um, we have a terrific appellate practice. Uh, that's the craft I wanted to learn, brief writing, appellate strategy, oral advocacy. And a couple of years after I joined the firm, I learned about the Ninth Circuit's pro bono program. And back in 2006, and I have no reason to think it's not the same now, they had a terrific program where they didn't just assign out any pro se appeal that came through the docket. They had a pro bono coordinator who looked at them all and made sure that the cases that were assigned to pro bono counsel were not cases where everything was waived, where there was no meritorious argument. They said, let's find the cases where it looks like the appellant would be meaningfully served and the court would be meaningfully helped by having pro bono counsel assigned to the case. And um, they assigned me to a case in 2006. I signed up, I said, you know, give me whatever you have. And the first case they gave me uh, was the case of a gentleman from the Philippines who lived in California since he was eight, had run afoul of the law, got into deportation proceedings. I guess by then they were called removal proceedings and was appealing his uh, removal order to the Ninth Circuit, and his main claim was he had been forbidden the right to apply for relief under Section 212C, the discretionary relief provision, which had been repealed in 1996, but then under the St. Cyr decision of the Supreme Court was restored for certain groups of people who'd pled guilty to convictions before the act. So he was in that category, but the BIA had ruled him out because of something, a new development in the BIA's jurisprudence called the Blake Rule. And I won't go into detail about what the Blake Rule was, and I'm very happy that I can use the past tense, um, but it was really kind of crazy. And I looked at it as a generalist who hadn't done much immigration law since graduation, and I said, you know, I, I took out my, my textbook dated 1995 and I read about Section 212C and the Blake Rule just seemed completely inconsistent with everything I knew about discretionary relief from removal. So I briefed his case. I went to the detention facility where he was being kept in El Centro, California, a four hour drive east of San Diego in the middle of the desert, about 10 miles from the Mexican border. We met, um, shook hands, I drove back to Pasadena I argued his case to a panel of the Ninth Circuit, and uh, with all respect to Judge Noonan and his colleagues, the panel was not at all interested in what I had to say. Um, in all fairness to them, uh, there were a few other cases that were raising the same issue that were in line ahead of our case, uh, and so the panel just said, look, we're gonna be bound by whatever the earlier cases do, so we're going to defer ruling on your case until the other cases came out. The other cases, again, uh, they all came out. They came out in favor of the government, just like every other circuit to address the issue but one. Um, my client in that case was named Joel Judelang. 
and it was complete happenstance and good fortune, his but more so mine, uh, that I was assigned to his case in the Ninth Circuit by the Ninth Circuit pro bono coordinator. And after we got the decision of the panel, we decided that we should take a shot at a cert petition. Um, and so, you know, it was a long shot because every other circuit but one had ruled against us. But with the help of subject matter experts like Debbie and like a whole bunch of real immigration lawyers who knew what they were talking about, we started writing a cert petition. The first thing we did, though, was try to get the Ninth Circuit to stay Joel's order of deportation so that he would not be removed from the country uh, until the Supreme Court had a chance to decide what it was going to do. We filed that motion. Uh, the government filed an opposition. And less than 30 minutes later, I got an order from the Ninth Circuit saying motion denied. One of the most difficult professional phone calls I've had to make was to call up Joel, who at the time had been released on bond from detention. So he was at home with his family in LA, and say, look, Ninth Circuit's turned you down for a stay. That means ICE could show up any min minute with the handcuffs. So go see your daughter, give her a hug. Go see your mother, give her a hug. Do whatever you need to do now to be ready for that. I'm going to stay up all night and write an emergency petition for a stay to Justice Kennedy, who is the circuit justice for the Ninth Circuit. He has the authority to stay your removal, but let me tell you, uh, I don't hold out much hope. So I wrote the thing, and we filed it the next day, and we explained, look, we, I understand every other circuit has ruled against us, and this issue has come up in a lot of previous cases, and you've always denied review, but we think now really is the time. And to our amazement, a few days later, Justice Kennedy granted the stay of removal pending filing of our cert petition. So I called up Joel again, and I said, you won't believe this. Um, but Justice Kennedy from the Supreme Court has granted a stay of removal. So you're, you're okay until we decide whether the court's going to take your case or not. And uh, Joel said, wow, it's great, really great. Do you think you could send me a copy of that that I can just sort of carry around with me? And I was like, very good idea, absolutely, yes. So I emailed that to him and he carried it around. And funnily enough, when, when we, after we filed the cert petition, the court granted the case, we were briefing it, he had to go back to the deportation office every three months or so to check in, right, to make, to show that he hadn't fled the jurisdiction and he hadn't committed any crimes, that kind of thing. And he went back and people said, so, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, the Supreme Court's taken my case. <laughs> and they said, what? <laughs> said, yeah, Supreme Court's taken my case. We've never had that happen to anybody before. And they realized at that point that they had no way, they did not know how to verify that statement. Like no one had ever come in and said, oh yeah, my Supreme Court, they like, yeah, right. So they couldn't go on and check the docket. Like they, they didn't know, there's no pacer for the Supreme Court. They couldn't go to, they knew the Ninth Circuit, they knew the district courts, they did not know how to check this. So they, they said to him, go home, come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. with some proof that the Supreme Court's taken your case. So he called me and said, Okay, you know, well, what can I do? I said, fine. Here's the formal letter saying the petition is granted. And here's the website, the link to the court's docket so they can go online, they can look at the docket, they can type your name in, up it comes. He went back at 10 a.m. and there were like 15 people waiting for him. Like everybody in the office was gathered to meet Joel Judelang and say, see, is this really? And, and, then, they, and then they saw it, they, they showed him the website, and then they were like, all right, you know, way to go, good luck, you know? <laughs> and every time he went back, all those people would show up and say, hey, Joel, how's your case going? <laughs> so we briefed the thing. Um, and in doing this, and this is what I was getting to, it's a long stem winding way of explaining the point I was trying to make, which is we brought to bear all the expertise and the resources that a firm like Wilmer Hale would bring to bear for our paying clients into this case. Um, we did painstaking research into the background of 212C, whatever legislative history we could find, all the cases, all the unpublished and published BIA decisions we could find. We had a coordinated and very carefully considered amicus strategy, which involved not only recruiting amici that we thought would credibly make points that we as a party couldn't make, but also making sure that they had capable Supreme Court counsel who would write terrific briefs that we knew the court would read. I had three full-on moot courts, um, including by people who had worked in the Solicitor General's office. Uh, one, when I did a moot at Georgetown, the presiding judge was uh, Patty Millett, who of course now is a judge on the DC circuit. And all these folks just put me through my paces and in many ways the moots were a lot harder than the actual oral argument. I would like to think that none of this actually made a difference. 
and that the Blake rule was just so crazy and so obviously crazy that it was a foregone conclusion that the Supreme Court was going to reverse it 9 nothing two months after oral argument. I'd like to think that nothing we did mattered at all. It would make me feel better about our system of justice, but I'm not sure it's true. I think there's a reason that firms like Wilmer Hale and, and others who are represented here, we're not the only ones, I, I think we're the best, but we're not the only ones, <laughs> uh, have specialized appellate practices where people do this on a sustained, coordinated basis. I think doing this stuff a lot helps hone your skills, and you can then bring those to bear for the benefit of immigration clients. And um, of course, it doesn't have to be appellate. If you're a trial lawyer and you do patent cases or securities cases or complex commercial cases, you can bring that skill set to bear to do some real good for people who need it so desperately. Um, and you know, I don't want to suggest that the benefit only flows one way. Obviously, being able to do this kind of thing gives you the kind of experience that you can then turn around to your paying clients and say, "All right, I, this is what I can do, and I can do it for you as well." So. I guess I just close to say, even if you're not lucky enough to work with Ira Kurzban or Eleanor Pelta or any of the other talented immigration practitioners uh, whom you've heard speak today, um, don't let immigration fall aside. If it's something you're passionate about, you care about, you go into private practice, um, seize the opportunities. They're there. You can help. Use your big law skills, and you might be very surprised at what you can get done. Thank you. So our next speaker is, uh, is Steve Legomsky, who is the um, John Lehman University professor at the Washington University School of Law. Uh, he's written, co-written, now co-authors, one of the leading textbooks in, um, in uh, immigration law for law students and law teachers. Um, and he's authored many other books and, and articles, including articles on asylum, which is an important the most important thing to write about. Um, uh, and uh, most importantly, he was uh, general counsel to CIS for two years between 2011 and 2013. And I think people have already made references to some of his extraordinary um, accomplishments uh, during what was no doubt a very frustrating period of his life, but rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> so please. Thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's a real honor and a treat to be part of this uh, wonderful celebration. We all love and admire uh, Debbie Anker, and we all know what a treasure uh, she has been for so many students and for so many uh, all too vulnerable clients and really for the entire um, uh, community. It was wonderful this morning for me when I arrived. I hadn't seen Debbie in a few years. And I arrived and got a big hug, and that really made my morning until Martha Minow had to say that Debbie hugs everybody. So, <laughs> so, so much for feeling special. Um, uh, so, Debbie, I just want to express um, <clears throat> uh, the same uh, feelings that I know everybody else has of thanking you and congratulating you personally, as well as John and Nancy and your entire team. I think you guys have been together longer than the Rolling Stones, if I recall correctly. <laughs> Um, and it's been an amazing uh, milestone. Uh, John and Nancy, I just thanked you and congratulated you just before you walked in. So, <laughs> so I want credit for that. Um, th this panel is about all of the different kinds of advocacy uh, strategies that those of us who care about immigrants and refugees have tried to use over the years. Uh, my own advocacy has been mainly through fairly traditional academic uh, channels, but as Debbie mentioned, I did serve for two years uh, as chief counsel of USCIS, and, so, and by sheer dumb luck, I really happened to be there at an amazingly uh, opportune time, because that was the time when we got to work on CIR and DACA and parole in place. Uh, and uh, the 601A provisional waiver program, uh, the implementation of the wonderful decision by the Supreme Court in Windsor over uh, striking down DOMA, uh, other smaller issues like the false claims to citizenship 
uh, by minors issues, uh, some issues involving the assisted, uh, the application of assisted reproductive technology techniques to the parent-child relationship, which opened up some additional claims. Just all kinds of wonderful progressive issues uh, that I was lucky enough to be there at the time they were under consideration. So I thought in, all, in light of all that, it would make sense for me to talk about internal advocacy within the government on immigration specifically. Um, I should probably preface this by saying that there are many people in government uh, who feel that internal advocacy really should not be a part of a government lawyer's role at all. Um, and I'm not dismissive of that philosophy. There, there is something to be said for it because there is some appeal to the idea that your own personal policy preferences should not uh, influence the advice of a government lawyer. Uh, that makes some sense in theory. I think the reality, though, is that uh, practically every single issue, legal or policy, that, re that reached my desk uh, was typically unsettled. If, if, the, if the law had been clear going in, it probably wouldn't have gotten to that level. We all know that the law, in our field especially, is riddled with ambiguities, and even short of outright ambiguities, we all know that the statute is full of uh, language that is broad enough which, when different fact situations are applied to it, uh, can give rise to reasonably permissible uh, differing uh, outcomes. So the question becomes, what's the government lawyer supposed to do in that case? Well, one option is to just say to the client, uh, if the client, especially if the client happens to be the head of the agency, to just say, look, here are the different permissible legal options. You just pick the one you think is best. That's an option. But I think most agency leaders uh, understand that lawyers are trained not just in law but also in policy, and they respect their lawyers, and they really do want to hear what the lawyers think about the issues that they are uh, expert on, even if they're pure policy issues. So with that preface, here's my vision of um, what a government lawyer's advocacy role should be. And I do feel a little bit uh, pretentious using the word vision because that's a word I typically associate uh, with important people like presidents uh, or maybe somebody under the influence of an hallucinogenic drug. But, but, typically, <laughs> but for what it's worth, um, here's what I think about government advocacy. Um, first of all, like any other lawyers, government lawyers are ethically bound to serve their clients. The big difference, it seems to me, is that in the, a private client uh, is typically interested in his or her own particular issues, whereas the government client uh, is, uh, has as his or her mission uh, serving the public. To me, it follows that the public interest is the responsibility of the government lawyer as well. And in turn, that means to me that it's not the, government, the job of a government lawyer and I think many government litigators in particular need to hear this lesson, uh, it's not necessarily the job of the government lawyer to try to, quote, win every case. Uh, the job of the government lawyer is not to play beat the immigrant or beat the refugee. Uh, rather, the job of the government lawyer, in my view, is to do whatever is necessary to ensure that the agency and the department and the administration faithfully follow the law and do justice. Um, sometimes, but rarely in our field, the law is crystal clear. When it is, I think you're ethically bound to follow it and to respect it. Um, but my view, and I think this is where reasonable minds can disagree, but my view is that no government lawyer should ever offer a legal interpretation of any ambiguous statutory provision, and no government lawyer should ever make any recommendation on a matter of policy without at least considering the actual practical impact that that recommendation will have on the people whose lives it will profoundly affect. And as this audience knows, uh, no caring person can spend any amount of time in this field and not be highly cognizant at all times of the compelling human needs of the population uh, whom we have the privilege of serving. So during my stint as chief counsel, I just made the conscious decision that advocating internally would be a huge part of my role, uh, both proactively when I felt there was something that the agency or the department or the administration needed to do, or reactively, which was more the case when issues uh, came to us. Uh, and that advocacy took two forms. A part of it was just my own uh, personal direct advocacy on specific issues, and a couple comments on that. Uh, typically, uh, and this is sometimes a surprise to some in the private sector, but on any significant uh, legal or policy issue in government, 
There are many, many people who have to be persuaded in order for it to happen. Uh, it's not a monolithic thing where all you have to do is convince uh, the head of the agency, because below the head of the agency are typically several components. In the case of USCIS, there are several different operational components, including the asylum office, uh, SCOPS, the field office division, and so on. There's the policy office, there are the systems people, uh, there are the management people, and so on. And any responsible agency head wants to know not just what does the chief counsel think, but what do all these other uh, component heads think as well. In addition, there are the analogous players in our sister agencies, uh, ICE and CBP. Uh, and in addition to that, there are, and that's all horizontal, above that are people above each of us. Uh, my position, in my position as chief counsel, I reported directly to the office of the general counsel of DHS. They had to be consulted on certainly any major issue and, of course, any issues that would also affect ICE or CBP. Uh, similarly, the head of USCIS, like the head of every one of the other component agencies of DHS, uh, had superiors in the DHS uh, headquarters. All of these people had to be consulted on anything significant. And that's just within DHS. Many of these issues cross-cut to other departments. We frequently have to work with people in the State Department or the Justice Department, occasionally the Labor Department, and certain other departments as well. Um, and sometimes if the issue was important enough, and many of the issues we dealt with were, uh, then the Executive Office of the President had to be brought in as well. The thing to understand about these different offices is that, just like DHS, they too had all their little internal parts. And sometimes the internal components of a given agency uh, as well as the individuals who staff them, will have differing views about what the best interpretation or the best policy is, or even whether this is an issue that we want to take up uh, at this time. Um, so what that meant as a practical matter was, first of all, immediate consensus on anything of any significance uh, was rare. Uh, compromises were almost always uh, required. It also meant uh, that this would take a very long time. Uh, that was one of the most frustrating things for me. Um, uh, there, there, was, there were these long sequences of simultaneous negotiations, uh, passbacks, revisions, renegotiation of the revised proposals, et cetera, and that can really drag on. Sometimes it's a matter of one crucial person allowing the issue to sit on his or her desk uh, for months at a time. Uh, and sometimes after all of this work, and after all of this elapsed time, and sometimes after all of this emotional energy, I would fail. It just wouldn't uh, go through at all. So I picked up a few practical lessons. Uh, one is patience. Not my strong suit. Um, I have many weak suits. That's just one of them. Um, in government, uh, almost any significant change just takes a horrendous amount of time for most of the reasons uh, that I just gave. And to someone like me, um, for whom waiting in a supermarket line is a major setback in life, uh, this, this can be really, really uh, frustrating, especially if you think it's something that seems like a no-brainer that could be adopted in minutes and it takes months. Um, a second lesson, though, is that if I anticipated resistance uh, on a particular component of USC from a particular component of USCIS, uh, or from ICE, or from CBP, and that was fairly common, um, I needed to pick up the phone and try to enlist uh, their input at an early stage. For one thing, I wanted to get a sense of what landmines I was going to be up against. And in addition, often they would raise uh, legitimate uh, concerns that you would try to find a way to accommodate without uh, giving away the store. And if you can get potential horizontal objectors ideally on board with you at an early stage, but at the very least in a position where they at least agree not to affirmatively object, then that goes a long way toward enhancing the chances of uh, the people above you in the pecking order uh, signing on to it. Um, that's my own advocacy at the leadership level. Um, the second strategy was really more long term. And Nikki Flores and uh, Aaron, who is also here, I think uh, are the new embodiment of this. Um, I felt it was very critical to inspire uh, my own lawyers, especially the new ones, to take internal advocacy as a serious uh, part of their role and then to try to offer them whatever training and whatever guidance I could to maximize uh, their effectiveness in that regard. Uh, they are career employees, and so they're the folks uh, who I knew were going to be carrying on the mission uh, long after uh, I was gone, and that meant, among other things, that in the long run, I knew that collectively they would have a far greater impact on agency policy uh, than I would in my uh, short-term individual capacity. And therefore, the speech I would give um, to new attorneys as well as old ones, and Nikki and Aaron uh, are both here, and they've heard this speech before, so if you guys 
are at all sleepy, this is probably a good time to take a quick nap, um, uh, just as if this were a real class. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but, but the things I would stress to them are the following. One is um, don't let the bureaucracy or the culture within DHS, because it's a powerful bureaucracy and a powerful culture, don't ever let them forget who you are and what you believe in. Uh, don't ever lose sight of your values. Fight, fight, fight for what you believe in. That's the first message. The second one is be smart. Uh, pick your battles with, with some intelligence. Some issues really just aren't that important. Some other issues at the other end of the spectrum are extremely important, but realistically, you're so far down in the pecking order that there's nothing you can say that will even influence, let alone uh, resolve the debate. Don't waste your time and your political capital on something you absolutely cannot change. And the third is, do fight hard and do be persistent, but do it with courtesy and respect and professionalism. Uh, for one thing, the people you're interacting with deserve your respect just as much as you deserve theirs. Uh, but from a more tactical standpoint, in addition, you're just going to be much more effective that way, not only in that particular battle, but also in your future interactions with these same uh, folks. Uh, your most powerful weapon is always going to be calm, logical, respectful uh, persuasion. If it's something you really deeply believe in, you should be able to make a solid, convincing argument on the merits, and that's what you should always try to do. And fourth and last, this is the hardest lesson of all, I hated this lesson, but it's really true. Uh, sometimes you're going to lose. It's just a reality. When you do, uh, you have to have uh, the humility and you have to have the maturity uh, to accept defeat graciously. And believe me when I say, I got really good at accepting defeat graciously. Um, at a certain point, you put it to rest and you move on, uh, in part because you have to keep reminding yourself that you do not have a constitutional right to see your personal policy preferences trump those of the agency or the department <laughs> or the administration. Uh, and partly, again, for tactical reasons. Um, you don't want to alienate the folks whose support might turn out to be crucial for the next issue uh, you're dealing with. So I would just say, whether you're in the public sector or the private sector, uh, either way, advocate hard, advocate smart, uh, and may the force be with you. So thank you. <laughs> Well, we can, uh, we can talk about this some during the uh, discussion time, but it just reminded me of the work on the gender guidelines where we worked uh, very closely with people at INS and, um, and it resulted in success. I personally don't deal well with failure, but, um, but anyway. Um, our next speaker is Lee Glernt, who is uh, one of the best friends of our clinic. Um, he is uh, he's deputy director of the ACLU's National Immigra Immigrants' Rights Project and has litigated uh, numerous cases in appellate court and for the Supreme Court, um, including Ashkark versus El Kid, which is a very famous case, and he'll talk about it. Um, and I probably shouldn't get diverted off of this, but Lee teaches, comes to teach at our our policy course every year, and he's the best teacher I've ever seen, and um, and uh, and he's a wonderful person. So, I'm looking forward to hearing your remarks today. Thanks all. Um, let me just say I, I share Steve's vision of a government lawyer. I do probably need Steve to talk to some of the, my government adversaries about the proper vision, because I'm not sure we always see that vision reflected in all our cases. Um, let me just, before I start, I just want to actually say a couple of words about the, what Mark and Steve said. One is I think that Steve makes a very good point about losing. I mean, obviously the humility and being gracious about it, but um, what we always say in our office is if you're not ever losing, then you're not bringing hard enough cases and you're not testing the limits. And, you know, all of you in this room are very creative, resourceful, serious lawyers. And so I don't think you ever want to look back on your career and say, I didn't lose a case. I mean, that'd be great. But I think, you know, we all know you're going to lose cases if you take hard enough cases. So I don't think there's any shame in that. And so I, I do want to reflect that. The other thing I wanted to um, say is something that, that Mark made a comment, but actually that a lot of his, his talk was about 
which is the importance of generalists. I cannot overestimate, overstate that. For me, the most important thing when I start a case is to always go to non-immigration lawyers and non-civil rights lawyers and see how does it hit them at a gut visceral level. I mean, I had someone tell me when I was starting my career, go to the nearest pub, turn to the guy next to you who's having a beer and just tell him the story of the case without legal jargon. Does he think it's fair or not? And that's the best, you know, and for those of you who are more refined, turn to the person at the opera or, but turn to <laughs> someone, turn to someone who's a generalist. I mean, and, and two types of judges. One is just the person on the street who's not a lawyer. Does it strike them as fair? But the other thing is turn to a very smart generalist like Mark. I mean, Mark has taken on so many immigration cases and been such a friend to the immigration advocacy community. At this point, he's almost slipping out of that generalist category. But turn to, turn to someone like him and really test your case, test your assumptions, test the logic, see whether you are just been with the issue, with the case too long, drinking the Kool-Aid too much. And so, so I cannot overestimate the role of people in firms and, and just elsewhere who are willing to take on these cases, even if it just means brainstorming the case with them, even if they're not working on it. Um, so let, let me just and also thank Debbie for inviting me here. It's really an honor. And obviously, Nancy and John, um, when I come up here to speak in Debbie's class, it's just, it's really inspiring to ha see that many students who are engaged and really thoughtful and spirited about it. It always lifts my spirits about people um, going on the next generation and doing work. Uh, you know, this panel is about different ways to advance immigrants' rights. Um, the ACLU pretty much is a kitchen sink operation. We do everything, right? We lobby Congress, we lobby state legislators, we use public education, different forms of advocacy, obviously litigation. I, there's a lot of my former interns in the audience, they might say the number one thing we do is have the young lawyer state of four in the morning. But um, we do a lot of different things. My own feeling is no one, you know, and obviously there's individual representation, there's impact litigation by different people out there. My own feeling is no one is better than the other. Um, and generally speaking, I think combining them all is the best way to go. I think it's very hard to litigate difficult issues these days without having an advocacy component up with, along with it, a public education aspect, seeing what fixes you can get from a state legislature, from Congress, from the government through administrative advocacy. Having said all that, I, just, I want to talk just for a few minutes, my time, about one form of um, advocacy that the ACLU does, probably more than any other immigration group. And that's what I call national campaign litigation, where we take an issue and we litigate it throughout the country. But we really litigate it throughout the country, try to be in every single court throughout the entire country until there's a resolution. Either Congress fixes it, somebody fixes it, we win in every circuit, or it goes to the Supreme Court and we hopefully win, but there's a resolution of it. Now, you know, obviously that's not something that everyone can do. I think the ACLU is particularly poised to do it because we have a national organization by nonprofit standards, we have a lot of resources. We also have the luxury of having state affiliates on the ground. We have a legislative office in Washington, so it's easier for us to do, but it's still not easy, and therefore we do it infrequently. Um, we've done it in the areas of judicial review, and I don't know whether Jerry Newman's here, but he was sort of the critical person with Steve on, on the judicial review issues. We've done it with detention, and we've recently done it challenging state and local anti-immigration laws throughout the country. How do we choose to do it? I mean, the first thing, and I want to echo some things that were said earlier and this morning, is it can't be issue-driven in some abstract way. This issue seems symbolically important, seems important to us. It has to be client-driven. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean one client sends us an intake letter and says, this is what happened to me. 
What we need to hear from is all of you throughout the country, individual immigration lawyers, advocacy groups, everyone we can hear from academics who say this is affecting lots and lots of people around the country, right? And then we need to decide, okay, well, even so, is it sufficiently important relative to the other issues? And, and as you all know, almost every issue you hear about is important and there's always a human face behind it. But if we take on this, can we have real impact? Can we potentially win it? Can we affect the law? And not just affect it in the short term, but can we affect it permanently? Can we make structural changes in the law that will last? That's a difficult decision to take on. I mean, for all of you in nonprofits, I think you probably know that the most important decision you make every month, every year, is strategic planning going forward. What are we going to use our resources for? The ACLU has more resources than most nonprofits but obviously it's still limited. And so if we're gonna do a national issue, it's gonna take up a lot of our resources and potentially lots of years. I mean, when we did the judicial review, we started in 96 with the passage of those laws and we had one very big victory in a case called St. Cyr in 2001, but it's still ongoing. Um, and so it's just a major, major undertaking and you wanna make sure you have the resources to do it. Um, the, you know, the next thing is whether we can really add value. And I think for us, what that means is, is a few things. It means our immigration lawyers around the country poised to handle the issue and so that our value is not adding that much. You know, we're not adding that much value. And I, I think what that comes down to for us is a lot of things. Sometimes issues are just the kind of issues that require so much research, so much work, so much background. Um, that you're just, the, the average immigration attorney, no matter how smart they are, no matter how diligent, is still juggling lots and lots of cases. And so that's one issue. The other issue I think is where the expertise goes beyond immigration. And this is, you know, where you get into generalists. The ACLU are not generalist, but obviously we deal with every civil liberties issue under the sun. So we can bring a lot of resources to bear. So for example, judicial review required enormous research into the suspension clause. Back, we went all the way back, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, in England, all over the world. And that's the kind of expertise, ex kind of research you're not gonna have in an immigration practice. Even the best immigration practice simply can't take years out to spend time in the Oxford and Cambridge libraries digging through those kind of materials. Um, and, and the fourth thing I think is, does it lend itself to that kind of national campaign litigation? And that obviously go, goes into a lot of things. One is just, are the legal issues gonna predominate? Because if we're doing cases all over the country and they're largely fact specific, that's gonna be impossible for us. So there has to be sort of those one or two threshold legal issues for us to take on where we can say, we're gonna put our resources into this and just do it everywhere and try and win those threshold legal issues. If they're too fact specific, then it doesn't really make sense. Um, you know, and I think we've been relatively successful doing this. There's obviously obstacles to doing it. And immigration, I think, presents one of the more difficult fields to do it in. I mean, you know, campaign litigation has been around forever, right? The sort of classic Brown v. Board of Education where Thurgood Marshall built a campaign to litigate those issues up through Brown versus Board. The immigration is difficult to do, I, I think, and it presents real challenges. For example, take judicial review. We were not able to bring a class action, pick our forum, pick our timing, pick our clients, right? What we had to do is find the lead case in every single circuit. Now, imagine what that meant in 1996. The law went into effect and was retroactive. The jurisdictional provisions applied immediately to cases in the pipeline. So at any given moment, there are hundreds and hundreds of deportation removal cases in the circuits. And so every case that was pending right then, perhaps we were about to be argued the day after the legislation was passed, all of a sudden the government came in because they could do it because they're involved in every case in the country and filed a brief saying, there's no longer jurisdiction to hear this case. 
And so what we had to do is go to every single place we could find, immigration lawyers, advocacy groups, farmers, the court clerk, everywhere to find out how many cases were pending to see if we could get involved in those cases. And what it meant is litigating literally night and day everywhere in the country to get involved because we knew that the average, some of the people were going to be pro se or the average immigration lawyer was not going to be able to respond to the historical arguments being made by the government. And so we really had a scramble. And I think the greatest accomplishment we had, we ultimately won that, that threshold issue about whether there had to be some judicial review in the St. Cyr case five years later, but we managed to do the lead case in all 11 circuits throughout the country. And that took a lot of scrambling. It took a lot of jumping on a plane at a minute's notice. And so that's obviously not something everyone can do, but, but I do think you know, it, it was helpful then because it's, I, I think for every judge in the room and every judge anywhere would tell you that as good as their law clerks are, as smart as they are, there's a limit to how much they can spend on one case. They're not going to be going and researching in Oxford libraries for a year. That's just unrealistic. And so they will tell you that they need help from the other side. But it's very difficult in the immigration world because you do have to find the individual cases. It's hard to bring class actions. And you also, doing a national campaign like this, it's very difficult to decide what your story is going to be. And by that I mean, I, my own feeling is that you know, litigation on hard issues is about telling a story, having a narrative, having a theme. And if you don't know which cases you're going to end up with in each circuit as the lead circuit, you, know, you might say, well, always go with the facts. The facts are going to be strong. You always want to have the human dimension. But think about if you don't know what the lead case is going to be in each circuit. We believe strongly in the principle of judicial review as a bedrock principle of our society. And we believe that no matter whether the person was accused of a heinous crime, and that's why they were going to be removed, or a very minor crime, but we could, if we decided to tell the story in one circuit because the person had a minor crime, that's a very difficult story to transport to another circuit where there may be a heinous crime. So we'd had to have a story, develop a story that would be usable in every circuit. And ultimately, it was about the rule of law and the history of how the federal courts in the best tradition had always stood up and said, you cannot deprive people of access to the federal courts when liberty is at stake. That's what the suspension clause meant. That goes back to England. But, but those are sort of some of the obstacles that go into doing it on a national campaign. And, and the, the reason I, I wanted to talk about this, because I think it dovetails with everything that Judge Katzman was talking about and all the other panelists earlier about sort of, we need lawyers. It really makes a difference. But I also think we need to have efficiencies in our system. You know, maybe that means getting more clerks in the immigration courts because that's a real bang for the buck because you have someone sitting there all the time. Maybe it means bundling cases in the circuits more. The circuits, you know, and I think some of the circuits, like the second, really reach out for amicus briefs. But maybe it means in other circuits, the courts reaching out for amicuses. Um, it's just looking for efficiencies. And the ACLU has picked this one way of of trying to get efficiencies. There's many others, and maybe we can talk about that in the question and answers. Thank you. So we're going to ask speak, uh, questioners if they possibly can to come up to this mic now, because we it helps with our recording. Uh, there's a mic on that side, too. so. Somebody's aggressively moving to the first mic. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, it's not on? Here, come <coughs> speak at this mic. Yes. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
<laughs> He's very obedient. <laughs> Um, you're implying that I was not at the top. So <laughs> uh, the agency was amazingly um, ready to go with the Windsor guidance even before Windsor was decided. Uh, the head of the agency, Ali Mayorkas, uh, was very proactive on this and he wanted to make sure that in the event that the court struck down DOMA, uh, we would not have to waste time afterwards starting from scratch and figuring out what the implementation would be. And so we were ready to go with the plan um, even before it came down. And I can tell you that if we had been able to decide the issue simply our, by ourselves, by administrative fiat, um, the guidance would probably have come out the very next day. All that remained was for us to uh, carefully study the opinion and make sure there weren't things in there that we were surprised by. Um, but because of both the importance and the sensitivity of the issue, the administration, I think wisely, uh, wanted to make sure that um, any guidance on Windsor was vetted, uh, first of all, by a central repository, and it designated um, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel at DOJ for that purpose. And in addition, that White House Counsel would have a chance to review it. So I would write up the guidance. Uh, there would often be revisions, uh, first of all, within USCIS, then by DHS, Office of General Counsel, other components of USCIS in the meantime would also have had a chance to weigh in. Uh, once we had a unified DHS position, uh, then I would send the stuff to somebody in the, office, in the Civil Division of Justice who would then screen it for the Office of Legal Counsel. Eventually it would get back, back to them. Sometimes there would be passbacks. Eventually when all of us were on board, it would go to the White House Counsel. They would clear it with the Domestic Policy Counsel of the White House. So this is just by way of saying that given all these passbacks, the fact that it happened in a couple of weeks was amazing. But I want to give a big shout out on this to actually the Board of Immigration Appeals because they decided a case called Zeleniak right at the beginning, just as we were about to issue our guidance anyway, uh, making clear that um, the Windsor decision does apply to immigration. Uh, I, I think if my, time, if my memory of the timing is right, and occasionally my memory is right, uh, that the article by Alberto, Alberto Gonzalez, I think it was in the Washington Post or the New York Times, I think that came out before the Zeleniak decision. I could be wrong on that. Um, Zeleniak definitely gave us the imprimatur, uh, put its imprimatur on it and gave us that chance. My own view, however, was that the reasoning of the Supreme Court in Windsor did apply with equal force to the immigration issue, notwithstanding the principle of plenary congressional power over immigration. We all know there are a couple ways to read the Windsor decision. Is it a federalism case or is it an individual rights case? But under either reading, uh, it seemed to me, and others agreed, that the um, decision did apply. I'll just mention the one big issue, the one big issue, it's somewhat buried, but if you look carefully at the USCIS guidance, you can find it, is what do you do if you have a person if you have a couple who is married, a same-sex couple married in a jurisdiction that permits same-sex marriages, but who are living or domiciled in a state that doesn't. Um, there is a line of BIA cases which says that if a couple is living, a married couple is living in a state that has a strong public policy against that particular type of marriage, then 
it will not count as a marriage for immigration purposes. Those were in the context of um, incest because different states have different rules about the degree of consanguinity that a marriage can have, uh, and also in the context of polygamy. And there were some who felt that that same reasoning should apply to immigration because, or to same-sex marriages rather, because there were states uh, who passed law, that passed law saying it is against the strong public policy of this state uh, to allow same-sex marriages. Uh, but we ended up concluding that that should not apply to um, immigration, and we were able to use the Lenny Act as further ammunition to solidify that position. Thank you. Margaret? You ask the man on the street what's an aggravated felony, they think it's like some kind of heinous crime. I mean, they have no idea that Congress has perpetrated this fraud on the public by, you know, redefining blue and pink in the code and these things that are misdemeanors or aggravated felonies. And the impact on the system of this nonsense definition of aggravated felony is the federal courts are flawed. You know, like nine out of ten cases, I think they go up to the Supreme Court. Really, the immigration has somebody fighting over whether something's an aggravated felony or it's not. The immigration courts are crowded, you got mandatory detention of all these people, and it all boils down to this really badly drafted statute that makes no sense and that the public doesn't understand. So <coughs> what I'm kind of wondering is what kind of advocacy efforts can get at those sort of inefficiencies and, and are is the ACLU doing, doing that kind of thing, identifying you know, particular high impact changes to the immigration laws that don't seem to have a constituency, so to speak, but you know, would cause the federal court backlog to clear out immediately if it just got, you know, fixed. Um, uh, yeah, I mean. Maybe you could repeat the question a little bit because these mics are not working. Or just incorporate the, the question you answered. The question generally was sort of talking about efficiencies in the system. And, I, you know, I was obviously talking about sort of process efficiencies. But Margaret's bringing up another point, which is, efficiencies because the code is ambiguous in places and so there's maybe unnecessary litigation and, and in particular she was mentioning the aggravated felony definition is as spur you know enormous litigation from the Supreme Court down um, yeah I mean you know we're working on those types of issues I don't know that those issues sort of fall for us into the efficiency box because you know, what we'd like to see is we, we think that the aggravated felony definition is far too broad and that people with very, very minor crimes are getting swept up into the system and it really makes no sense. You know, but from an efficiency standpoint, from what you're talking about, it wouldn't matter whether they limit the definition or broaden it as long as it's fixed. I mean, so we would like to see it be more efficient and narrower, but I don't know that at least speaking for the ACLU, we would like to see the efficiency go away if they said, here's a fixed definition, it's gonna sweep in everyone, even someone who jumped the turnstile once. But, you know, and I think, I mean, this is not anything new, but I think what we have is basically both sides would like to see it change, you know, both sides I would like to see it change, but the politics of it would get so messy looking for a fixed definition. I don't think either side would wanna see necessarily efficiency at the cost of, a new definition that wasn't to their liking. I, you know, and Steve may have a different view coming from. No, actually, you almost took the words right out of my mouth. I, I think it, um, it actually is less an efficiency issue uh, than a political issue. Um, probably the aggravated felony definition is very efficient in the sense that it's a really fast, easy way to remove lots and lots of people from the United States if that's the goal, right? Um, to me, it's, um, it's instructive that the original aggravated felony definition, I believe, covered murder, um, drug trafficking and weapons trafficking in 1988. I think that was all it covered. And what I've noticed is that all these expansions to the aggravated felony definition, I think almost all of them, happens to occur in the autumn of even-numbered years. 
uh, <laughs> right before congressional elections at a time when congressmen wanted to be able to go back and show their constituents how tough they were on, quote, criminal aliens. So I, I do think it's more a pure political issue than anything else. The only thing that I can think of that can be done from an advocacy standpoint, apart from trying to get politicians not to act like politicians, is within the agency there is room for interpretation. It's, this is more an ICE issue than it is a USCIS issue, and it's certainly an EOIR issue. Um, but NGOs have done a wonderful job of litigating um, cases like LeoCal and others that have somewhat narrowed it, but I agree that's only a minor fix at the margins and doesn't fix the endemic problem that you've described. Yeah, if I can just add something, I guess it might not work, but um, it seems to me that there would be support on both sides of the political aisle for a definition that said an aggravated felony is, you know, let's repeal the whole thing and replace it with an aggravated felony is something that is a felony and for which the person served, you know, pick your sentence. Some people more broadly because you wouldn't have a lawyer to be able to go in and you know manipulate whatever the sentence is so that even though the guy's doing 25 years in jail, it's not an angry felony because it doesn't meet the statutory definition of murder, you know, manslaughter, right. right? So it seems to me like there would be support on both sides of the aisle for that, and yeah. it would be appealing to the voters because right, you're cracking down, you're going to get all those felons, <laughs> you know, yeah. that did those heinous crimes and not let the lawyers manipulate the system, and you clear out the backlog in the federal courts and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so I'm Mary Hooper from Boston College, and I guess since the mic's not working, you're speaking so loud. loud. It's great. So, um, I started this conversation with you earlier, Lee, but um, the issue of a right to counsel, a court-appointed counsel, is obviously the forefront of everybody's mind. I mean, we've got the Tessman Group working group coming up with these great projects, but I've read enough scholarship now about how Padilla caused us to rethink deportation as punishment, meaning that some of the constitutional protections should apply, including the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Um, and at the very least, it should be sort of a Matthews v. Eldridge test, let's rethink deportation altogether and you know, call it what it is and at least appoint counsel. Um, and so what we see is, is more of this, like for more compelling groups of people, they will get counsel or they will be, it will be more attractive or possible to litigate counsel for a right to counsel, like in the Franco Gonzalez. But I just wonder if that's a priority now for the ACLU, or just if where you think this issue is going. Yeah, and I, I think everyone may have comments on this. And um, it's definitely a priority for the ACLU. I mean, you know, and, and there's always, I mean, these are strategic judgments that everyone goes through about, do you want to take on right to counsel as a whole? Or do you want to start with particularly vulnerable groups? And we started in the Franco case with people with mental illnesses, you know, and then people talk about for kids, for people in detention, maybe for people with citizenship claims, you know, and on. And obviously, there's you know, there's pros and cons to doing it each way. You you start with particularly vulnerable groups, and then you slowly get to harder groups, and people say, well, no, 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 not the harder groups, and you you sort of left them. You know, it made it more difficult, but you start with the whole thing at once. People say, no, we're not going to give a right to counsel for every single immigrant. But, you know, you know we are, it's, it's a major strategic priority for us. We are going to continue with it. But I, I don't think that litigation is, you know, the complete answer necessarily. And I think, obviously, what Judge Katzman's doing is, you know, the words can't even describe how enormously important that is. Because I, I think what you really do need is you need the communities, by which I mean not just the lawyers generally, you know, immigration lawyers and non-immigration lawyers, you need cities buying into it, you need states buying into it, because you really do need the resources. Because the one thing I would not want to see happen is everyone has, or some large subgroup has a right to counsel, but we can't provide them with quality representation. And I think, I think you made the point as an immigration judge, there are times when a really bad immigration lawyer can be worse than having someone who's pro se, and I fully subscribe to that. 
you get someone whose own life is at stake and they just have a little bit of common sense, but they're fighting for their own life, they're going to be better than, you know. So I think one of the things I think the casting group is doing is making sure that there's both going to be quality and quantity. But I think that's a real buy-in you need. And so there is a danger of it just being court ordered and then how are we going to fill all those. But the short answer is yes, I think that there's more and more openings. It's a difficult fight um, for a lot of reasons, but it's definitely an enormously high priority for us. Well, I guess, the, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm also wondering, you know, whether in combination with whether this is like to get Mark and Lee, I mean, you've worked together before, but in concert, but that, you know, that I'm, I'm taken by Mary's point about challenging the underlying idea that deportation is not punishment um, and whether that, whether there's some individual case or something that would appear that would be right. worth arguing that about while the ACLU w or and others of us work on issues of access to counsel in a, in a piecemeal way. Right, I mean, we are in a broader sense even than counsel now arguing from Padilla and other cases that there should be a proportionality principle read into the immigration statute and we have a case pending in the First Circuit now that says that sometimes deportation is just too disproportionate. Removal is just too disproportionate, and there needs to be a proportionality principle, and it's constitutionally derived. You know, obviously we don't know where we're going to get with that, but you know, some of it is sort of laying the groundwork for you know maybe this is a 20-year campaign. Who knows? But. That I think what everyone in this room has seen is that the deportation laws have gotten so harsh that there, this, you know, I, I, you know, going back to sort of what people, well, no one would really know if you stopped them on the street what an aggravated felony is. But I think people, even people who are not sympathetic to immigrants, can be be shocked about some of the people who are facing mandatory deportation. So I think that is one of the next waves: is to say, look. You know, we normally have been always fighting for procedural protections, but is there a way now to start fighting f in a sort of more substantive way for some type of proportionality principle? And we do think some of the civil cases the Supreme Court has decided about proportionality with jury verdicts is a hook, Padilla is a hook, and there and there's other ways. But, it, you know, I don't know where we're going to get with it, but it, that is, a, as you said, a priority to start doing that. So can you speak up? I'm so sorry the bikes aren't working. Yeah, what are you guys doing? <laughs> we only have That's going to be the last no. question. I'm sorry, we're, we're just about at our time. We are um, a little past it. You know, and maybe Mark wants to speak this since he obviously won that case. For us. Um, the detention has always been a major priority for us for 96, and that, as I said, is one of the sort of national campaign issues. Um, we would like to see, obviously, a reduction in detention, a reduction in mandatory detention, but not just even mandatory detention, even sort of how the bond and bail procedures work, and to, to, to get people's ears about their alternative ways to ensure that people don't skip their removal proceedings or not a flight risk. I mean, the Veer Institute is doing great work about alternatives, ankle bracelets, monitoring, and just studies that really show 
whether people will return for their removal proceedings or not. I mean, I agree. I think that is one of the hooks, is that there is this national dialogue going on now about over-incarceration, which as a general, is a general ACLU priority, and I think immigration can fit in there. You know, whether the narrative is going to be the same for immigration detention as general prison population, I think, is a tricky one. And I think that's one of the things you all, you know, know as well as I do. It's, it's difficult to figure out the right narrative sometimes for immigration reform, but I do think that provides some hook for us. I mean, the, the case that comes to mind when thinking about immigration detention is a case that was decided while I was clerking called Demore versus Kim, which you probably heard mentioned. Um, by the way, there's a really great dissent in that case. Um, you know, you read it, 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 evidently Justice Souter was researching it really hard and worked <laughs> really hard on writing the thing. I commend it to you. Um, so, Demore was a case that, I mean, when it came out, I was just sort of personally depressed for weeks about it because it felt like there was a real missed opportunity and it was just fundamentally uh, not missed on the part of the people who advocated it, but missed on the part of the court to get it right. Um, and what's heartening to me is to see the work that the ACLU and others are doing to try to use some of the statements in that case and the way that uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist worded the majority opinion in order to get bond hearings uh, for people who are subject to quote unquote mandatory detention. And there have been some notable victories in California and a great decision from Judge Ponser here in Massachusetts um, to the effect that if your detention goes beyond about six months, you're entitled to a bond hearing to determine whether you're a flight risk or a danger to society, which is ultimately the standard that the dissent in Demore was uh, talking about. Um, so there are often ways in which maybe at the time you look at a situation and say this just doesn't make any sense, it's arbitrary, but you can find through creative advocacy of the type that the ACLU and many others do, um, some way to sort of take, you know, let loosen the pressure valve, as it were. And that's part of what makes, I guess, immigration law such a Rube Goldberg machine that's hopelessly inefficient, and I wouldn't argue with that. I think that's absolutely right. We tighten down aggravated felonies, so then we loosen 212C relief a few years later. It's just because it just seems like it's so unjust, we try to create other ways to uh, mitigate the, some of the very nasty consequences without addressing the root problem, because the root problem fundamentally is a political one, and at least for the moment, it seems like Congress is just intractably stalled and not able to do anything that would address it in a rational and coordinated way. Um, okay. But I think that's, that's what I'd say about detention. Okay, we're running about five minutes over, so I apologize. And this is Sabi Ardalan. I don't know if people met her, who's assistant director at the clinic at, here at Harvard. And Phil is, anyway, there's lots of our staff roaming around. <laughs> um, but anyway, you're just going to tell where we're. You're going to have to speak into this mic. That's okay. The breakout sessions are upstairs on the third floor, and there'll be people right outside here who can guide you up. Um, and you can just choose which